which applies to all spheres of life. The practice of equality necessitates acceptance and protection of individual choices. The capacity of non-heterosexual couples for love, commitment, and responsibility is no less worthy of regard than the heterosexual couples. Let us preserve this autonomy so long as it does not infringe on the rights of the others. After all, it is my life in the song by Bon Jovi. Having had the benefit of reading the draft and the revised opinion circulated by the learned Chief Justice, we find it necessary to pen our reasoning and conclusions in this separate judgment. The learned Chief Justice has recorded in detail the submissions by counsel and claims made. They therefore do not require iteration. Similarly, the sections addressing the union government's preliminary objections that is the discussion on the court's authority to hear the case and the queer, that queerness is a natural phenomenon that is neither urban nor elite or parts we have no hesitation in agreeing with. However, we do not agree with the conclusions arrived by the learned Chief Justice and the directions issued. We do not agree with certain premises and conclusions that he has recorded. They are, one, that there exists no fundamental we do agree, sorry, we do agree with the premises and conclusions that he has recorded. They are that there exists no fundamental right to marry under the Constitution, that the Special Marriage Act is neither unconstitutional nor can it be interpreted in such a manner as to enable marriage between queer persons, and that C, gen, transgender persons in heterosexual relationships have the right to solemnize marriage under the existing legal frameworks. We have briefly highlighted our main points of agreement and reasoned in more detail those aspects which we, with, uh, with which we respectfully we cannot persuade ourselves to concur. We had the benefit of perusing the concurring opinion of Justice Narsimha. We endorse those observations and conclusions fully. The reasoning and conclusions shall be read as supplementing that of the present judgment. For long periods in societies, many societies, the choice of a matrimonial was not free. It was bound by social constraints. Much of the time, marriage was seen as an institution meant for procreation and sexual union of spouses. In most societies, marriage had cast roles for the spouse. They were played fairly inflexible with men controlling most decisions and women placed in a subordinate position with little or no voice. And for the longest time, no legal authority, autonomy, or agency. For millennia, custom, tradition, and law subordinated wives to husbands. Notions of equality of partners or their roles were not uncommon, were uncommon, if not totally unheard of. All these underwent radical change. Legislative activity is aimed at bringing about gender parity through prohibiting prevailing practices that further inequality and sometimes even criminalize certain customs, resulting in legislations such as Equal Remuneration Act, the Dowry Prohibition Act, introduction of provisions in the criminal law, which gave teeth to such provisions, such as Section 498, Section 113, A and B of the Evidence Act, etc. Other practices aimed at realization of social goals and furthering the mandate of Article 15.3, in respect of children, such as the free right to free universal education under Article 21A, the right to free education and Act 2009, the Child Labor Prote Prohibition and Regulation Act 1986, the POXO, what we call as POXO, the Juvenile Justice Act, etc. In all these, the parliament or concerned legislatures donned the role of reformers and furthered the express provisions of the Constitution and joining state action in furtherances of furtherance of articles 15 2 15 3 17 23 and 24 24 marriage has historically been a union solemnized as per customs or personal law tracing its origin to religious texts legislative activity in the personal law field so far has been largely though not wholly to codify prevailing customs and traditions and regulating them only where needed 
The instances that stand out are the enactment of the Succession Act, the Hindu Women's Right to Property Act, 1937, the Hindu Marriage Act, the Adoptions and Maintenance Act, the Hindu Succession Act, the Hindu Minority and Guardianship Act, and the Indian Divorce Act. As amended, the Muslim Personal Law Sharia Application Act and the Anand Marriage Act, 1909. These laws mostly codified traditions and customs which existed and also to an extent regulated marriages and succession laws. They also sought to introduce reforms. For the first time, monogamy was enacted as a norm applicable to all Hindus. Likewise, the option of divorce was enacted together with grounds on which other remedies such as judicial separation and maintenance could be sought. Further, the minimum age of marriage was also enacted existing through provisions in various personal law laws and imposed through the Prohib prohibition of child marriage act as seen the two kinds of legislations have regulated marriage the first like sma hma the hindu disabilities removal act and the hindu widow widows remarriage act removed barriers and enabled exercise of meaningful choice especially to women the second kind of laws are those which enacted restrictive guidelines essentially to further an orderly society or to protect women, define minimum age for marriage, child marriage restraint, marriage of individuals within prohibited degrees of relationships, etc. Whereas some restrictions in a sense codified and recognized existing customs, such as being enacted by enacting prohibited degrees of relationships, the rule against insanity, Rule, rules enabling declaration of nullity or divorce on ground, others were meant to further interests of women and child, children. Such reforming and codification, how did no, however, did not cover the entire field. For instance, in the field of succession and inheritance, the Hindu Succession Act enacts only certain broad features, leaving untouched the rights of various communities and sections of Hindus to work out their rights in succession, the joint family and co-personary property. And this unwritten codified law is enforced on, not only in regard to inheritance, but also in the field of taxation. Likewise, the law accommodates and accords primacy to customs. Similarly, also recognizes customary divorce amongst Hindus. Neither the Hindu Marriage Act nor the Hindu Succession Act applies, apply to members of tribal communities. The latest in fact, in the latest three judge bench decision in Revana Siddhapa versus Mallikarjuna, this court clarified that with the enactment of Section 16 of HMA, the legitimacy conferred upon children born of, born of void or voidable marriages would be that they are entitled only to a share in their parents' property, but cannot claim it of their own right as a consequence of which they cannot seek partition during the lifetime of their parents. The court also held that they cannot claim any rights other than what was expressly provided for. Thus, uncodified law and custom was upheld. The role of the legislature has been to act as a codifier and in many instances not enact or codify existing customs or practices and wherever necessary intervene in furtherance of articles 14 and 15.3 to enact laws. Parliament has enacted, intervened and facilitated creation of social status, this is marriage through SMA, and enabled the creation of the institution of adoption, which was available amongst only certain communities. These and other legislative interventions are the result of the state interest in reforms or furthering the interests of given communities or persons. For these reasons, we do not particularly subscribe to the characterization of democratic democratizing intimate zones as discussed in the learned chief justice's opinion these outcomes were driven by enacted law furthermore there was state interest which impelled regulations regulation of such relationships as for instance ensuring that minimum marriage age for girls likewise there is state interest in regulation regulating what kind of relationships that is prohibited degrees of relationship should be enacted as disqualifications to marriage. When there is a discussion or summation of the jurisprudence on Article 21 and the various facets 
which this court has recognized, such as privacy, choice, autonomy, and dignity. Then we move on. The court's intervention in oft cited decisions on behalf of the petitioners has been to protect citizens or those approaching them against threats of violence. The instances are Shakti Vahini, Lata Singh, Shafin Jahan, Lakshmi Bhai Chandra Geet, etc. These decisions were based on the state's duty to protect citizens and enable the exercise of their individual choice in the face of threats. Other decisions, that is Joseph Schein, Navtej, and Independent Thought, were instances where specific provisions that criminalized or made exceptions to criminal behavior were struck down or read down in the enforcement of fundamental yes. rights. That is Articles 14, 15, and 21. Along the way, Putuswani articulated the broadest right to privacy, which embraces within its fold the right to exercise one's choice of a life partner and to lead the life free from external barriers. This court has recognized that marriage is a social institution. As elaborated in part one, marriage existed and exists historically and chronologically in all of the senses because people married before the rise of the state as a concept. Therefore, marriage as an institution is prior to the state, it precedes, precedes it. The status is still not one that is conferred by the state, unlike the license regime in the US. This implies that the marriage structure exists regardless of the state, which can later utilize or accommodate, but cannot abolish it. Under this view, terms of a marriage are set to a large extent independently of the state. Its source is external. That source defines the boundaries of marriage. This implies that state power to regulate marriage does not sit easy with the idea of marriage as a fundamental right. In a, attempting to analyze the claim to fundamental right, that there are two primary, primarily competing claims about the nature of marriage. One being that the state should exercise more control over marriage to support traditional purposes and perceptions this is the quotation, and the other, that each individual should have the right to define marriage for themselves. If indeed there is a right to marry, unless it is elevated to a right akin to Articles 17, 23, and 24, which apply to both state and non-state agencies, and are cast in positive, in, in, in fact, emphatic term, terms, it cannot be operationalized. These provisions most emphatically create positive obligations. Likewise, Articles 15, 3, 15, 4, 15, 6, as well as 16, 4, 16, 6 highlight state interest in creating conditions to further the goal of non-discrimination. Yet the previous decisions of this court have carefully held such provisions to enable the state and in the sense oblige it to take measures, but ruled out court mandated policies and laws. In our considered opinion, this is not, however, one such case where the court can make a departure from such rule and require the state to create social or legal status. What is being asked for by the petitioners is state intervention in enabling marriage between queer or non-heterosexual couples. Civil marriage or recognition of any such relationship with such status cannot exist in the absence of a statute. The demand hence is not, is that of a right of access to a publicly created and administered institution. There is a paradox here or a contradiction which runs to the root of the issue and base on this court's mind heavily, in that the creation of the institution here depends on state action, which is sought to be compelled through the agency of this court. All decisions relied upon Putuswami, Navtej, Shakti Vahini, and Deepika contain broad observations with respect to individual's choice of their partners, and also a reference to non-conventional relationships. Some observations are undoubtedly be to, to be found in these judgments that cannot be referenced to hold that a right to marry automatically flows from the manner of the provisions of a part three, which the petitioners assert. There cannot, for the above reasons, be a per se assertions that there exists an unqualified right to marry, which requires treatment as a fundamental freedom. We agree on this conclusion arrived at by the learned Chief Justice and his analysis of all these cases, that the Constitution does not expressly recognize a right to 
Mari. While we agree that there is a right which we characterize as a right to a relationship, which is recognized in Navtej that uh, the, the queer couples and other rela uh, relationships of that kind can have a union, we characterize it as a right to relationship to avoid confusion. We squarely recognize that it falls within Article 21, as already recognized in these cases. The right to relationship here includes the right to choose a partner, to cohabit and enjoy physical intimacy with them, to live the way they wish to, and the other rights that flow from the right to privacy, autonomy, and dignity. They are, like all citizens, entitled to live freely and express this choice undisturbed in society. Whenever their right to enjoyment of such relationship is under threat of violence or coercion, the state is bound to extend necessary protection. That is the natural consequence of this court's judgments in Navtej, Putuswami, etc. If, if it is agreed that marriage is a social institution with which the state is unconcerned, except to the limited state interest in regulating some aspects of it, does it follow that any section of the society, leaving aside the issue of rights of non-heterosexual couples, which wishes for the creation of a like social institution, or even an entry into a zone which is not popular or otherwise does not fall within the institution of marriage, can seek relief of its creation by court intervention. In the draft circulated by the learned Chief Justice, the reasoning that there is no fundamental right to marry and thereafter, nevertheless to proceed to delineate the facets of features which unions other than marriage are deprived of, where it's a closer look. The summation of various rights which such couple is said to be deprived of is used to delineate the contours of the right to enter into a union and justify a positive obligation. There cannot be any doubt that individuals have the right, have the choice of their life partners and the right to live the lives they wish to undisturbed. This is the essence of what this juris jurisprudence of this court has been. That is explanation of the right to life and other rights enumerated or discovered by the interpretive process, privacy, choice, dignity, etc. Re repeatedly, the decisions of the court have emphasized on the non-discriminatory and positive content of certain fundamental rights. In, in fact, the court has underlined the obligations of the state to create conducive conditions conducive to the exercise of the right to equality and to realize fraternity, refer, refer to the decisions in Thomas and Indra Sani, which expanded the understanding of substantive equality, though without making enabling provisions enforceable by the court. This court also in some decisions accepted the argument that given the nature of fundamental right, rights and their evolving content in many circumstances, it might be necessary for the state to intervene and protect the fundamental right concern, thus creating an atmosphere conducive for the enjoyment of such right. Lata Singh dealt with honor killings of couples. In Aramugam Sirwai, the issue was virulent caste slurs and violence, which were crimes. The court required administrative and police officials to take strong measures to prevent them. In Shakti Vahini, the, which dealt with, Shakti Vahini dealt with threats by Khap Panchayats, and the court held that the state is duty bound to protect fundamental rights and an inherent aspect of Article 21 of the Constitution would be the freedom of choice. The court issued directions. The judgment of the chief, learned Chief Justice propounded a theory of a unified thread of rights, entitlements flowing from it, and how lack of recognition results in deprivation of the specified rights under Articles 19 and 25, in addition to Article 21. To the extent that assertion of sexual or gender identity in exercise of free speech association to express manifestations in whatever form are concerned, one cannot join issue. Equally, if, if by some state process, measures or conduct has been barred from exercise, expressing one's choice publicly, the reasonableness of that prohibition or order can be tested on grounds enumerated in Article 19.2 and other grounds. However, when the law is silent and leaves the parties to express choice, 
Article 19.1a does not oblige the state to enact a law or frame a regulation that enables facilitation of that expression. All judgments were based of this court were based on effects of laws or policies based on statutory provisions. Equally, in the absence of a legal framework enabling citizens to form a particular kind of association, as for instance, recognition of a limited liability partnership, which was not recognized and given legal status till recently, the court could not have validly created the regime by enabling enabling recognition or regulating such associations. Similarly, the absence of any enacted law, which uh, uh, enables facilitation of transport, it is hard to visualize that a citizen can approach the court and seek the construction of a road to enforce the right to travel or seeks the, seek the court's intervention to create a network of roads. Likewise, the absence of basic housing, again, the court, if approached for enforcement of 191E, would not call upon the state to create one by either framing a general legislative policy or through law. Furthermore, this court has also recognized that there can be even reasonable restrictions in the acquisition and enjoyment of certain types of properties in many states. Given the nature of rights under Articles 19 and 21, the enjoyment of which are limited to the extent reasonable laws within the bounds of specified provisions, the enact uh, enact in the legitimate jurisdiction of this court, it would be difficult to translate positive obligations as articulated by the learned Chief Justice's opinion. There is no difficulty about the right of two consenting per persons to decide to live together, to, to, to cohabit and create their unique idea of what a home, unconstrained by what others say. This is the sequitur to Kutuswami and Navtej. Conduct hitherto criminalized is now permissible. The liberative effect of section being 3377 being read down is that two individuals, regardless of their sexual orientation, are enabled to live together with their dignity and also protected from any kind of violence for living and existing together. Therefore, the right to be left alone, the right to exercise choice, right to dignity and live, live one's life with, one, with the person of one's choice is an intrinsic and essential feature of Article 21. We, even if we want to, for argument's sake, recognize an entitlement under the Constitution to enter into an abiding cohabitational relationship or union, in our opinion, it can follow, it cannot follow to a claim for an institution. There are almost intractable difficulties in creating through judicial orders or dictat, a civil right to marry or a civil union, no less of the kind that is sought by the petitioners. Ordering a social institution or rearranging existing social structures by creating an entirely new kind of parallel framework for queer couples would require conception of an entirely different code, a new universe of rights and obligations. This will entail fashioning a regime of state registration of marriage between queer couples, the conditions for a valid and matrimonial relationship amongst them, spelling out eligibility conditions such as minimum age, relationships which fall within prohibited degrees, grounds for divorce, right to maintenance, alimony, etc. The learned chief, with, as, as a result, with due respect, we are unable to agree with the conclusions of the learned chief justice with respect to tracing the right to enter into or form unions from the right of freedom of speech and expression, the right to form associations, along with right to uh, any other corresponding positive obligation. It is reiterated that all queer couples have the right to relationship and choice of partner, right of cohabitation as an integral part of choice linked to their privacy and dignity. Any further discussion on the rights which, con which consenting partners may exercise is unnecessary. No one has contested the two queer couples have the rights enumerated under 191, Articles 191A, C and D, or even the right to conscience under Article 25. The elaboration of these rights to say that the exercise of choice to such relationships renders these meaningful and that the state is obligated to recognize a bouquet of entitlements which flow from such abiding relationship of this kind is not called for. 
We therefore respectfully disagree with that part of the learned Chief Justice's reasoning, which forms the basis for some of the final conclusions and directions recorded in his judgment. with the conclusions of the learned chief justice with respect to the inapplicability of the sma and we also add uh, certain observations the gender a gender neutral of interpretation of sma and its provisions much like many seemingly progressive aspirations may not really be equitable at times and can result in women being exposed to unintendable unintended vulnerability especially when genuine attempts are made to achieve a balance in a social order that traditionally was tipped in favor of cis heterosexual men. The purpose of the terms like wife, husband, man and women in marriage is to protect a socially marginalized, marginalized demographic of individuals. For in instance, women facing violence by their partner have a right to recourse under the Domestic Violence Act, which assures and is meant to assure that the victims are safeguarded and provided relief. In fact, provisions of SMA for alimony maintenance confer rights to women. Likewise, certain grounds of divorce, conviction of husband for bigamy, rape, etc., entitled the wife additional grounds. Other provisions enact separate degrees of prohibited relationships. Section 4C uses the term husband and wife. There are other provisions which deal with uh, which specifically used gendered terms. The general pattern of these provisions, including the specific provisions enabling or entitled, entitling women certain benefits and the effect of sections 19 to 21a, is that even if for argument's sake, it were accepted that section 4 could be read in gender neutral terms, the interplay of other provisions which could apply to such queer couples in such cases would lead to anomalous result results rendering the SMA unworkable. It is important, now we, we, there is a section that deals with the discriminatory impact on queer couples. It is important to recognize that while the, the state ipso facto may have no role in the choice of two pre-willed individuals to marry, it's characterizing marriage for various collateral and intersectional purposes, such as permanent and binding legal relationships, recognized as such between heterosexual couples only, and no other impacts to a couples adversely. The intention of the state in framing the regulations or laws is to confer benefits to families or individuals who are married. This has the result of adversely impacting the queer couples. By recognizing heterosexual couples union and cohabitation as marriage marriages in various laws and regulations as in employment or nominations in pension provident fund gratuity life and personal accident insurance policies for credit particularly joint loans to both spouses based on their total earning capacity for purposes of receiving compensation in the event of fatal accidents to name a few and not providing for non-heterosexual couples results in their exclusion the individual earned benefits by each partner or both collectively, which would be available to family members, such as employee state insurance benefits in the, in the event of injury of an earning partner, provident fund, compensation, medical benefits, etc., are examples of what the injured or deceased partner, by dint of her or his work, became entitled to, or the mem members of her family became entitled to. The denial of these and inability of the earning partner in a queer relationship therefore has an adverse discriminatory impact. The state may not intend the discrimination or exclusion in the conferment of such benefits or social welfare measure. Yet the framework of these policies expressed in favor of those matrimonial relationships results in denial of entitlements despite the professional abilities and contributions which the individual might make to society. The objective of many of these laws or schemes is to confer or provide entitlements based on individual earning and contribution. For example, Provident Fund is payable to the 
due to the employee's personal contribution and status as employee. Similarly, objective entitlement of benefits of employees as state insurance, etc., flow from individual status, work, and effort. Major part of these benefits, or all of them, flow in the event of certain even uneventuality, uh, eventualities such as fatal accident or death. The design of these statutes and schemes is to enable both the concerned subscriber or the employee to receive them or in an unforeseen event such as death for his dependents to receive them. The restrictive way, way in which dependent or nominee excludes their enjoyment to the intended beneficiary. Addressing all these aspects and concerns means considering a range of policy choices and involving multiplicity of legislative architecture governing the regulations guided by diverse interests and concerns, many of them possibly coalescing. On 3rd of May 2023, during the course of the hearing, the learned Solicitor General upon instructions had expressed the Union's position that a high-powered committee headed by the Union Cabinet Secretary would be formed to undertake a comprehensive examination to consider such impacts and make suitable recommendations in that regard. So we proceed to agree with uh, the learned Chief Justice's conclusions with regard to the uh, right of uh, transgender persons in heterosexual relations to, have, to marry under existing laws. On the issue of adoption, uh, we, we express our disagreement and voice our concerns in the following manner. We, we have voiced our concerns and uh, laid it out in some detail, which I do not wish to uh, stay, uh, read. This is not to say that unmarried couples, whether queer or heterosexuals, are not capable or suitable to be adoptive parents. However, once the law permits, as it has done adoption by both single, single individuals, the likelihood of their joining and cohabiting cannot be ruled out. In such event, de facto family unit can and does come about. The underlying assumption in the law as exists is that such unmarried heterosexual or queer couples should not adopt. It needs to be closely examined. Similarly, the needs of such couples to have and raise a family in every sense of the term has to be accommodated within the framework of the law. The existing state of affairs which permits single individuals to adopt and later live as a couple in exercise of their choice, in effect, deprives the children of such relationships, various legal and social benefits, which are otherwise available, given the objective of uh, to a married couple. In other words, given the objective of Section 57, the state as parents patria needs to explore every possibility and not rule out any policy or legislative choice to ensure the maximum welfare and benefits reach the largest number of children in need of safe and secure homes with a promise for their fullest development. Uh, response to the learned Chief Justice's uh, uh, comments on, the, on our draft, which I propose to read, pa part of which I propose to read, This court's observations with respect to the learned Chief Justice's reasoning centered around the enunciation of the bouquet of rights emanating from his provisions and locating an obligation has to be seen in the backdrop of the unanimous view of this court that the fundamental right to marry is not found within the Constitution. Therefore, it is our considered opinion that to create an overarching obligation upon the state to facilitate through policies the fuller enjoyment of rights and Articles 19 and 25 is not rooted in any part past decision or jurisprudence that queer couples have the right to exercise their choice, cohabit and live without disturbance is incontestable. In the same way that they are owed protection against any threat is the natural corollary of their right under Article 21. Consider in this context also the nature of relief sought and the positive obligation fashioned. Whilst there are innumerable judgments on the positive contents of the rights under Article 21, 
there are countless judgments on the, that insist upon the separation of powers when it comes to matters of policy and the courts not being the appropriate forum for adjudication of the same. The polycentric nature of this issue is compelling. Next, as to the reasoning that our conclusion on the challenge of SME and subsequently finding on the disparate discriminatory impact faced by the queer community, a small comment is called for. The section discussing the provisions of the SMA and the challenge to its validity, validity was based upon whether it violated the Constitution on the ground of impermissible classification on Article 14, for which the object of the act, act to facilitate marriage between interfaith couples, wherein the time at the time marriage or even a couple only denoted heterosexual couples in the light of same-sex relationships being criminalized and its provisions are relevant factors. Classification involves differentiation. Further, this court has discussed how underclassification per se does not warrant invalidation. In contrast, in the later segment on discriminatory impact, the issue that this court was considered, considering was not reasonable classification, but impact upon queer couples through neutral laws or regulations that they encounter in their everyday lives. The purpose of which or even their substantive provisions have nothing to do with marriage. This, it is rather to confer other benefits, many of which are earned or accrued on account of individual skill. Yet the framing of these benefits or their intended beneficiaries were articulated in terms of entitlement to families or spouses, tends to exclude from its ambit queer couples. When such queer couples are entitled to benefits wherever they fulfill other eligibility criteria, it is the disparate impact of these neutral laws in the disbursement of entitlements or benefits, which is soon through the effect or impact lens. Therefore, the discussion on constitutionality of SME is markedly different from the section on discriminatory impact in certain point, points for queer couples as they have no avenue for marriage like heterosexual couples. In the latter, the impact of various laws were pointed as starting point for the state to take remedial action. be sorely mistaken if we presume what the queer community in all its diversity seeks and lays, lays it out as a formic framework. Many may welcome civil unions as a pragmatic first step, while some may find it yet to be another inequitable solution to the feeling of exclusion that persists in society against this community, and one which simply repackages the stigmatization felt. Many may desire marriage as understood in the traditional sense to escape their social societal realities, a form of financial and social emancipation from opposing natal families or diametrically opposite to assimilate and gain more social acceptance. Yet others may, as a result of their experience, reject altogether the institution of marriage and all the social obligations and associations that come with it, but still want protection of their rights. Certainly what the former group may want does not hamper or hinder the latter in any manner, for it is a choice that they seek. That the state should facilitate this choice for those who wish to exercise it is an outcome that the community may agree upon. Yet the modalities of how it should play out, what it will entail, are facets that the state, here the legislature and the executive, needs to exercise it fast and further and south. Now, whether this will happen through a proactive action of the state or as a result of sustained public mobilization is a reality that will play out in India's democratic stage and something only time can tell. The state may choose from a number of policy outcomes. They may, they may make all marriage and family related laws gender neutral or may create a separate SMA-like statute in gender neutral terms to give the queer community an avenue for marriage. They may pass an act creating civil unions or a domestic partnership, among the many other alternatives. Another consequence may be that rather than the union, the state legislature takes actions or enacts law. What is, however, certain is that in question of such polycentric nature, whether social or political, the court must exercise restraint and defer to the wisdom of the other branches of the state, which can undertake wide-scale public consultation consensus building and reflect the will of the people 
and be in their best interest. If as a result of this, a law is enacted that undermines or violates the constitutionally protected rights of an individual, no matter, no matter how minuscule the, uh, their right to seek redressal from this court is guaranteed. Let the petitioners seek what many of us may deem to be normal or accepted next step in the life upon attaining certain age, a certain age and perhaps take for granted is not lost on us. Their desire for social acceptability in the manner that has been historically known through the social recognition that marriage affords and the lack of which causes them the feeling of exclusion and hurt is one that as individuals, especially donning the robes of justice, we can certainly have deep empathy with. However, we are deeply conscious that no matter how much we empathize with the outcome sought, the means to arriving at such a destination must be also legally sound and keep intact the grand architecture of our constitutional scheme. If we, for if we throw caution to the wind, we stand at the risk of paving the way, wherein each brick we, uh, we, uh, wherein each brick may feel justified to unfold untold consequences that we could not have contemplated. While molding relief as a code, we must be cognizant that despite being empowered to see the capabilities of the law in its grand and majestic formulation, we must not be led aground because we are blinded by its glow. Now I pass on to read the conclusions and the final directions that we have uh, summarized. The court hereby summarizes its conclusions and directions as follows. There is no unqualified right to marriage except that recognized by statute, including the space left by custom. Two, an entitlement to legal recognition of the right to union akin to marriage or civil union or conferring legal status upon the parties to the relationship can be only through enacted law. A sequitur of this is that the court cannot enjoin or direct the creation of such a regulatory framework result in legal status. The finding in one and two should not be read as to preclude queer persons from celebrating their commitment to each other or relationship in whichever way they wish within the social realm. Oh, previous judgments of this court have established that queer couples have a right to union or relationship, be it mental, emotional or sexual, flowing from the right to privacy, right to choice and autonomy. This does not, however, extend the right to claim an illegal entitlement to any legal status for the said union or relationship. The challenge to SME on the ground of underclassification is not made out. Equality and, and non-discrimination are basic foundational rights. The indirect discriminatory impacts on relations in relation to earned or compensatory benefits or social welfare entitlements to which marital status is a relevant eligibility criteria for queer couples who exercise choice to form relationships have to be suitable, suitably addressed and removed by the state. These measures need to be taken with expedition because inaction will result in injustice and unfairness with regard to enjoyment of these benefits available to all citizens who are entitled and covered by such laws. As held earlier, this cannot, this court cannot within the judicial framework engage in this complex task the state has to study the impact of these policies and entitlements. Consistent with the statement before this court during the course of the proceeding, the union shall set up a high-powered high committee chaired by the cabinet secretary to undertake a comprehensive examination of all relevant factors, especially including those outlined above. In the conduct of such exercise, the concerned representatives of all stakeholders and the views of all states and ter union territories shall be taken into account. The discussion on discriminatory impacts is in the context of effects of the existing re regimes on the queer couples. When a heterosexual couple's right to live together is not contested, the logic of the discriminatory impact faced by queer couples cohabiting together would definitionally, however, not apply to them. Transgender persons in heterosexual relationships have the freedom to en and entitlement to marry. Regulation 5.3 of CARA regulations cannot be held void. At the same time, the court is of the opinion that CARA and the central government should appropriately consider the realities of de facto families where single individuals are permitted to adopt and thereafter start living in a non-matrimonial relationship. 
in an unforeseen eventuality, the adopted child in question could face exclusion from the benefits otherwise available to adopted children or married couples. This aspect needs further consideration for which the court is not the appropriate forum. Furthermore, the state shall ensure, consistent with the previous judgments of this court, that the choice exercised by the queer and LGBTQ couples to cohabit is not interfered with and they do not face any threat of violence or coercion. All necessary steps and measures in this regard shall be taken. The respondent shall take suitable steps also to ensure that queer couples and transgender couples are not subjected to any involuntary medical or surgical treatment. The above directions are in relation to transgender persons are to be read as part of and not in any manner whittling down the directions and in NALSA, Supra, so far as they apply to transgender persons. The questions are disposed of in the above terms. View of uh, Brother Ravi Bhatt as stated in the judgment. I am conscious of the ordeals that arise from multiplicity of judicial opinions in cases involving constitutional questions. Here I consider it worthwhile to pen the present opinion given the significance, significant nature of the questions involve polyvocality in the exercise of adjudicatory function may not necessarily be viewed with discomfort if complemented with judicial discipline it is truly reflective of diversity of judicial thought at the very outset i have given my conclusions while agreeing with the opinion of justice but i will read the conclusions the question of marriage equality of same sex lgbtq couples did not arise for consideration in any of the previous decisions of this court, including the decision in Navtej Nalsa. Consequently, there cannot be a binding precedent on this court. The reasons for arriving this conclusion are articulated in detail with Justice Watt. The rights of LGBTQ persons that have been hitherto recognized by this court are the rights to gender identity, sexual orientation, the right to choose a partner, cohabit and enjoy physical and mental intimacy, in the exercise of these rights, they have full freedom from physical threat and from coercive action, and the state is bound to afford them full protection of law in cases these rights are in peril. Third, there is no unqualified right to marriage guaranteed by the Constitution that qualifies it as fundamental right. I have given my detailed opinion. In one paragraph, I would read that. In my considered opinion, the institutional space of marriage is conditioned and occupied synchronously by legislative interventions, customary practices, and religious beliefs. The extant legislative accommodation of customary and religious practices is not gratuitous and to some extent conditioned by the right to religion and right to culture, constitutionally sanctified in Article 25 and 29 of the Constitution. This synchronously occupied institutional space of marriage is a product of our social and constitutional realities and therefore, in my opinion, compared to judicial perspectives offer little assistance. Given this nature of marriage as an institution, the right to choose a spouse and the right to a consenting couple to be recognized within the institution of marriage cannot but be said to be restrictive. Coming back to the conclusion, Right to marriage is a statutory right and to the extent it is demonstrable a right flowing from the from a legally enforceable customary practice in the exercise of such rights statutory or customary the state is bound to extend the protection of law to individuals so that they can exercise their choices without fear and coercion this in my opinion is the real import in the decision in Safil Jahan and Shakti Vahani the constitutional challenge 
to Special Marriage Act 1954 and Far Foreign Marriage Act must fail for the reason indicated in the opinion of Justice Butt. Similarly, Justice Butt also rightly finds the semantic impossibilities of gender neutral constructions of the Special Marriage Act and Foreign Marriage Act on both E and F of his opinion, Justice Butt has exhaustively as to the reasons that they have, they need not now be supplemented. I find no right to civil union or an abiding cohabitational relationship conferring a legally enforceable status cannot be situated within part three of the constitution. On this count, I too agree with Justice Butt, but I have supplemented it in my opinion, having considered that there exists no unqualified right to marry in the ordinary course, no occasion would have arisen for any further deliberation. However, as the learned Chief Justice, in his opinion, has arrived at a conclusion that there exists a constitutional right to a union or an abiding cohabitational relationship, it is necessary for me to express my opinion on this newfound construction. The learned Chief Justice locates components of the right to union or an abiding cohabitational relationship under Articles 191A, C, E, 21, and 25 of the Constitution. In my opinion, it would not be constitutionally permissible to identify a right to a union or an abiding cohabitational relationship, mirroring the institution of marriage. The learned Chief Justice identifies tangibles and intangible benefits, that is, bouquet of entitlements that arise from state recognition and regulation of marriages. The Chief Justice further opines that the right to marriage is not fundamental. However, it is in these tangible and intangible benefits, the denial of which, according to the learned Chief Justice, must inform the reading of a constitutional right to an abiding cohabitational union. In other words, the benefits of marriage, however fundamental to a fulfilling life, do not make marriage itself a fundamental right, but they render the right to an abiding cohabitational union fundamental. I find it difficult to reconcile these two principles. I finally conclude, I will read the other last two. I also agree with the reasoning and the conclusions of Justice Butt with respect to constitutionality of regulations, 5.3 of CARA regulations. I've concluded with what I strongly feel. I am not oblivious to the concerns of LGBTQ partners with respect to denial of access to certain benefits and privileges that are otherwise available only to married couple. The general statutory scheme for the following benefits, gratuitous or earned property or compensation, leave or compassionate appointment, proceed on a certain definitional understanding of partner dependent caregiver and family. In that definitional understanding, it is no doubt true that certain classes of individuals, same-sex partners, live-in relationship, and non-intimate caregivers, including siblings, are left out. The impact of, the, of some of these definitions is iniquitous and sometimes discriminatory. The policy considerations and legislative frameworks underlining these definitional contexts are too diverse and to be captured and evaluated within a singular judicial proceedings. I am of the firm belief that a review of the impact of the legislative framework on the flow of such benefits requires a deliberative and consultative exercise, which exercise the legislature and executive are constitutionally suited and tasked to undertake. Thank you very much. Thank you.